This one's a banger. We've got the All In Crew on the next big AI giant. If you're following tech, you will love this one. There's an enormous amount of energy, almost a surfeit of energy. Do you have this unfair advantage where if you need a vast amount of energy to throw out a compute problem, do you effectively get it for free or do you have to pay for it as well? No, of course not. When I took this role, I think one of the key things I said, look, what can we really compete and what can we do to offer to the world something that the world desperately needs today? We are really just at the beginning of what I would call the AI inferencing world. While the model training will continue to evolve, but now as we move into accelerated compute, I think the demand is going to become much larger than it exists today. So how do we, and, and what's the challenge? The challenge is really simple, power. You know, how do you really find power? So that's where I think Saudi Arabia has a big role to participate. Outside of the United States, outside of China, I really think Saudi Arabia has a good shot to be the third largest country in infrastructure. We have to go through processes to secure power from the Ministry of Energy, through the local electric company. I am treated as fairly as any other entity that comes to the country. My rates, my tariff is equivalent to what Google would get, to what AWS get. But however, the energy generation that exists in Saudi Arabia is just remarkable. I think what I told many people, maybe Saudi Arabia today led the world in energy exports via oil. We should look at an opportunity to lead the world through energy exports via tokens. And, but that's really a key area that I think we could differentiate. Tarek, as you are building your infrastructure, there is supply chain and strategic partnerships and relationships that I'm sure emerge here in the United States, but also in China. And Saudi Arabia seems to be in this really kind of interesting position as a large energy supplier, as a large partner in capital and now in building that could create tension between the rivalry, the global rivalry between the US and China. How do you think about managing each of those two markets and how you establish relationships and where do you align yourself? So if you see how Humane was launched, and I wish I could take a small credit for this, but I've asked for one thing before President Trump came to visit Saudi Arabia, we should, you know, please launch the company 3 p.m. before. Because we wanted to see, uh, ensure that the alignment that we are going after, we're going after really where the innovation is, uh, the talent that exists, the infrastructure that exists. And let's be really realistic and truthful. Today, the US is leading, especially on the semiconductor side, and we don't want to miss this opportunity. So if you see our partnership that we have done with AMD, with a startup called Grok, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, it shows you clearly our commitment to this relationship and partnership, and it's really deep. Not only on the silicon side, but the same thing you're going to hear very soon on the AI and the software application, and that's why Humane to succeed really needs deeper engagement, relationship. I spend a lot of time with startups in the U.S. and, uh, you know, the hope and the optimism I have and David and the team has been doing really a great job with this is our ability to say, we understand very, very well the concerns that one might have. But if you see about my partners that we have selected from software layer in the cloud to manage tenant management, to the security on the data center, to make sure that these servers are secured. We will do everything that is required with the optimism that Humane will be thought through as a trusted supplier for the US. David um, Sachs, how important is the American and the kingdom's relationship globally and for humanity in terms of the, the president's agenda and his prioritization? Well, it's been a critical relationship for the U.S. and for Saudi Arabia since, I think, 1945, if not before, when the, the founder of Saudi Arabia, the King Ibn Saud, met with our president, our king, so to speak, FDR, on a battleship. And they hammered out the foundation of the modern world, which is the U.S. would provide security for the region in exchange for the steady flow of crude. And that, you know, that was, I think FDR did that on his way back from Yalta. And people don't know as much about that as they do the Yalta meeting, but that was a very important understanding. And then the relationships evolved over the last 80 years. But what I can tell you, I went with the president on the trip in May to the Middle East. And number one, like you said, the business culture in Saudi Arabia is very Americanized. Many of the Saudi elite have studied in the U.S., they want to have a good relationship and a partnership with the United States. There's nothing competitive at all about that relationship. And when it comes to high tech and AI, they want to be part of our technology ecosystem. 
when I got back to Washington, I was really surprised at how controversial it was that we wanted to do business with the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia in particular. The way I see it is very simple. Saudi Arabia is going to have data centers, of course. Every sovereign country that can afford them is going to have data centers. Is that going to be American technology or Chinese technology? It's basically going to be our companies or it's going to be Huawei. It's binary. It's binary. And why would we want to push any country into the arms of Huawei? Especially when their preference is to work with America. Well, I think it's especially for two reasons. One is the proximity that that region has to 4 billion people. Yes. Because if you think about building data centers, ultimately inferences, there's a certain window of time and you have to be under several hundred milliseconds. But if you do that and you draw that radius, you're counting half the world's population. We, we can't strategically ignore that. Yeah, and otherwise, that's, you'll be forced to do it with somebody and else. At the time, by previous administration, at the time that happened, it was justified on the grounds that the U.S. was the only game in town. We were the only ones who could really make advanced semiconductors. So therefore, we could impose whatever restrictions we wanted. Nobody would have a choice. But since then, if you're reading the headlines over the past few months, it's all been about Huawei, CambraCon, SMIC, China is rapidly advancing. Dylan Patel from Semi Analysis just had a report. By next year, China's going to be making millions of chips. Admittedly, they're not as good as American chips. But if we deny the rest of the world the ability to participate in the American tech stack, then they will participate in the Chinese tech stack. And I think the question of what we sell to China will always be a complicated question for obvious reasons. But when it comes to the Middle East and the rest of the world, I think it should be an easy question that as long as these countries are abiding by our security requirements and they want to be partners and allies of the United States, we should allow them into the American tech ecosystem because otherwise we're just creating a Huawei Belt and Road. Saudi Arabia wants to shift from exporting energy as oil to exporting energy as AI tokens. As infants demand explodes beyond training, the countries with abundant power will convert electricity directly into intelligence and export the results globally. Saudi Arabia is positioning to lead the world in energy exports via tokens instead of oil, capitalizing on the coming inference demand explosion where power availability determines who can produce intelligence at scale. Maybe Saudi Arabia today leads the world in energy exports via oil, but they're looking to lead the world through energy exports via tokens. In my opinion, this is a brilliant strategic pivot that recognizes energy advantage doesn't change, but how you monetize it does. Saudi Arabia has been the world's major oil producer for decades. They have more energy production capability than they can currently sell profitably, but you can't efficiently export electricity. Transmission losses over long distances make it uneconomical, so that energy advantage was locked into physical commodities like oil and gas. AI inference changes the equation completely. You can convert electricity into computation locally, produce AI tokens, and export those globally at effectively zero marginal cost. An AI query result weighs nothing and travels at the speed of light. That's the perfect export product for a country with surplus energy capability. And then also focusing on inference versus training is a critical distinction. Training large AI models is what everyone focuses on. It requires massive computers for weeks or months, but once models are trained, inference is where the ongoing demand lives. Every chat GPT query, every AI assistant interaction, every autonomous vehicle decision, that's all inference, and inference demand scales with usage, not with model improvements. So think about this one. OpenAI might train GPT-5 once using enormous compute, but then billions of people run trillions of inference queries against that model. The total compute for inference dwarfs the compute for training. As AI becomes embedded in every application and device, inference demand becomes effectively unlimited. It's constrained only by available compute capacity, which is constrained by available power. Saudi Arabia is saying demand will be much larger than exists today as we move into accelerated compute shows that they understand this inflection point. Right now, we're early in AI adoption. Most companies are experimenting, most consumers use AI occasionally, but as AI capabilities improve and costs decline, usage becomes constant. Every search, every email, every decision gets AI assistance. That's when inference demand explodes. Data centers in Virginia or Silicon Valley face electrical grid limitations. Building a new power generation near population centers is expensive and faces regulatory hurdles. But Saudi Arabia can build power generation wherever they want using cheap local energy resources. They don't have the same constraints. 
Claiming the number three position globally after the US and China is an ambitious but achievable goal. The US has tech leadership and massive existing infrastructure. China has scale and government coordination. Saudi Arabia has the energy advantage and capital to build infrastructure aggressively. That combination could genuinely make them the third AI superpower if they execute. The concept of energy exports via tokens is perfect because it makes the value proposition clear to Saudi's leadership. They understand well energy exports. That's been their bread and butter for 80 years. Framing AI inference as the next evolution of energy exports connects to the current strategic thinking rather than requiring them to think of themselves as a tech company. This also explains why Saudi Arabia is building relationships with the likes of AMD and Nvidia and other AI startups so aggressively. They're not trying to build the entire stack themselves, they're positioning themselves as the infrastructure provider. You bring the chips and models, we provide the power and data centers. Together, we produce tokens that serve global markets. That's a much more achievable strategy than trying to compete with the US tech companies on innovation. And the timing is perfect because inference demand is just starting to ramp. If they build infrastructure now, while demand is still emerging, they're positioned to capture growth as demand explodes over the next five to 10 years. If they wait until demand is already massive, they're too late and the US and China already have the locked in market. But Saudi Arabia's strategy only works if they can access American technology, which is where export restrictions become critical. Every sovereign country will build data centers regardless of US restrictions. So the only real question is whether they use the American technology stack or get pushed into using Chinese technology like Huawei. David Sachs frames it clearly. Saudi Arabia is going to have data centers. Every sovereign country that can afford them is going to have data centers. Is that going to be American technology or Chinese technology? This is the strategic reality policymakers in DC don't always seem to understand. Export restrictions don't prevent countries from building AI infrastructure. They just determine whose technology gets used in that infrastructure. And if the choice is between no AI infrastructure or Chinese AI infrastructure, countries will choose Chinese every time. This binary framing is important because there is no third option. It's not American chips or nothing, it's American chips or Chinese chips, American cloud infrastructure or Huawei cloud infrastructure, American AI models or Chinese AI models, countries that want to participate in the AI revolution which is every country that can afford it, will build infrastructure regardless of what the US allows them to buy. Saudi Arabia is the perfect example. They have the capital, the energy, and the strategic motivation to build AI infrastructure. If the US says you can't buy Nvidia chips or AMD processors, Saudi Arabia doesn't just give up on AI, they call Huawei, they call SMIC, and buy Chinese alternatives. Maybe those chips are one or two generation behind American chips for now, but they're good enough to be useful. And once Saudi Arabia builds their entire infrastructure on Chinese technology, they could be locked in for decades. And the preference to work with America is a critical point. Saudi Arabia wants American technology. They're partnering with Nvidia, AMD, Qualcomm, the Saudi elite studied in America, and the business culture is Americanized. This isn't a hostile relationship where we need export controls to prevent technology transfer to enemies. This is a willing partner saying we want to buy American and US policy might potentially make that difficult. The proximity to 4 billion people within the inference latency window is something which also makes this even more strategic. If the Middle East builds AI infrastructure on Chinese technology, that infrastructure serves half the world's population with the Chinese tech stack. That wouldn't be just losing a single customer in a single market, it's losing inference over how AI develops for half the world's population. The simple question David Sachs poses should drive policy. As long as these countries are abiding by our security requirements and they want to be partners and allies of the United States, we should allow them into the American tech ecosystem. One of our clients started with zero audience. Now they're doing $100,000 months thanks to YouTube. And they're not alone. We've helped three businesses hit that level just by growing them a YouTube channel. Want to see how this could work for your business? Book a call with me below.